please do pray. Um, so I was listening to a beautiful um, and a wonderful um, um, teaching uh, on this verse by um, His Holiness Keshav Swami. Um, so hopefully I'll be, I've been able to uh, take some of his uh, teachings um, to share with all of you, but uh, please do, um, do correct me if I go wrong anywhere. So in this purport, uh, so we are into Cant 3 now, and in this purport, um, uh, we hear about uh, the demigods. So Sukhdev Goswami is telling Parikshit Maharaj um, how some people get material happiness uh, or want to get material happiness by worshipping the demigods. Um, but in the purport, Srila Prabhupada tries to make us understand that is that if one is intelligent enough, um, he wouldn't try any of that. He wouldn't really worship just the demigods. He would understand who the real person to worship is. But there are various other things to um, to just worshipping the, the demigods. Um, there is no right or wrong around this. Um, there are there are just two extremes. Uh, you know, there are one group of people who only worship the demigods um, and think them to be the supreme. And there's the other group of people uh, who completely ignore the demigod and uh, belittle them uh, or disrespect them. Um, as Vaishnavas, uh, we have been advised by the Shastras and by our Gurus uh, to take the middle path. And um, in the purport today, or in the verse today, we will be hearing about how to worship the demigods and um, what we can do um, to worship the demigods or what not to do and not to worship the demigods. So a few things to talk about in this uh, verse. Now, um, the whole verse talks about lots of demigods and where uh, if people want wealth, they can worship this good demigod. If they want, you know, beauty they can worship another demigod if they were if they want fame they can uh, so on and so forth so the entire verse talks about lots of demigods who the material minded people can worship should they want to just get um, material um, um, benedictions um, and just want to satisfy their sense gratification but in the purport, um, Prabhupada draws attention to the word intelligence quite a few times. Um, and there is the there he talks about the people with real intelligence and the people with false intelligence or the people with low intelligence. And he says that people who are bereft of any good sense. Um, their intelligence is actually deluded by Maya. Um, and that is the reason they aspire for material enjoyment by pleasing the demigods. But what happens is that by doing so, they keep repeatedly over millions and zillions of lifetimes, they repeatedly ignore the real problem of life, which is birth, old age, disease, and death. So uh, Prabhupada also draws attention to in the purport of how rare the human life is um, and how even rarer are the people who in the human form <coughs> are able to recognize the supremacy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and realize the true purpose and goal of life. So intelligent people <coughs> should try to avoid the aspirations of, you know, seeking um, just temporary through the temporary um, uh, sense gratification and by worshipping uh, uh, just the demigods. But what they should ideally seek is the permanent life, um, which is returning home with, and home to Godhead. So that's the per that's the verse, and that is and Prabhupada 
um, instead of talking about the various uh, demigods as mentioned in the verse, um, Prabhupada actually mentions about why it is more intelligent to actually um, not worship the demigods just for material desires. Um, and um, he gives some examples which we will come across later. And he further mentions that the intelligent people actually re recognizes the true problem in life, which is birth, death, old age and disease, and try to overcome that by seeking the permanent life and returning, wanting to return back to Godhead. Now, um, when we look, um, why, why, when we try to analyze the fact, uh, why is it that some people want to um, worship the demigod or they worship the demigod? What did they really seek? So whether they seek, you know, fame or, uh, or beauty or knowledge or wealth, whatever they're seeking, their ultimate desire or the end point of that seeking is happiness. So through that beauty, they want happiness. Through the knowledge gained, they want happiness. All the wealth gained, they want to enjoy and they get uh, want to get happiness. So whatever they are desiring and want to uh, get uh, by worshipping the demigods, um, they are ultimately seeking happiness. But there are four fundamental problems in seeking such kind of material happiness. And the first one is futility really futility. People look for happiness in the material things, but they never get them fully. Because what people perceive as happiness is not really happiness. It is just the absence of distress. So as, as we have been told in the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, that that, is, that, that happiness is only the absence of distress the real happiness, the bliss of the ananda, of the satchit ananda, that is the personality of Godhead, and that exists in us as well because we are parts and parcels of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That ananda is completely and totally absent in the material world. And that ananda or that happiness is only present in the in the spiritual world. So it is completely futile to seek for that happiness in this material world. What real happiness is, is only, only the absence of distress. Whether it is, you know, we want to get uh, uh, happiness in relationships, in position, in wealth. Even though we try hard, they don't really make us the happy uh, as we think we want to be. There is always that tiny bit of frustration somewhere, um, you know, hidden in those happiness. Because, um, again, as the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita says, you know, with happiness comes distress. So even though there is, you know, if, if we have lots of wealth, there comes, you know, um, the the uh, the worry of what will happen if my wealth is all taken away. What will happen if I lose my beauty? What will happen, you know, if I, when I grow old? <laughs> so the happiness one seeks for, even if one thinks that they're happy, they're actually not happy. So that is the futility of the whole point of seeking this happiness. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just uh, coughing a bit today. So that's the first point, you know, when we look, when we try to, um, worship demigods just to get that temporary happiness in this material world. This is the first thing that we need to remember that at the end of the day, there is that point of things being really, really futile if we just want uh, only happiness only in this material world. Now, sometimes people might argue that, um, so what, you know, I, you know, I don't, I, I just want this happiness, whatever I'm getting, I'm happy with that. Okay. Um, so if we, if we do get, 
even if we do get the temporary happiness, they may not have the understanding that these are temporary. So the happiness that they receive, whether through through any means, you know, if it's, you know, uh, being healthy, being, you know, um, well, being wealthy, whatever they get, if they think they're happy, there is also the point of insubstantiality. And that is the second point we need to remember. So when we are talking, when we are worshipping the demigods, yes, um, we we try to get that happiness but if we think of the first point as you know there is that sense of futility in it the second point we come to is that there is that sense of insubstantiality and what exactly do we mean by that meaning that you know we get that happiness but somewhere we don't think that's enough so we get those riches we get wealthy but we still want more we are in a happy position in life, but there's something else, something more we look for. There never comes a point when things we, we say, oh, I'm absolutely saturated in happiness and I do not want happiness anymore. There is always that extra thing that we look for. And it happens a lot when one runs after an idea. So one thinks that yes, by worshipping so-and-so demigods, if I get this amount of good bank balance, I think I should be happy. So that is, and they, they think that, you know, there is an ideal, that is my ideal, to get that amount of money. And the next day, the following day, they see somebody else who's richer than them, and their ideal changes. It changes to a different position, and they want a bit more. So they go and worship the same demigod again to ask for more money or to ask for, you know, a better position at work. So the the um the the ideal point keeps changing either due to ignorance or due to ego. And when we say ego, sometimes people might think that, okay, I want this. And it becomes a, a, a point of, you know, if I don't get it, my pride will be hurt. If I don't get this promotion, I will lose my face in front of my colleagues. So I go and worship a demigod and I ask for a good position at work. And it becomes more of a pride thing, an ego thing. What they don't, what they ignore is that, you know, through this, you know, if they want more and more and more, not only are they hurting their own selves, but they might end up hurting others as well. They might hurt other people who are maybe more eligible to, uh, to get that promotion. Uh, they may hurt feelings of others, but because they are so, they, they are either ignorant um, or they are completely covered with um, a huge sense of wanting to gratify their senses, they completely ignore anything and everything around it. So they lose track of what is the truth? What are they running after? Is there justice in that? Is there right in that? Is there dharma in it? They completely fall off the track. So they go back and go back and back to the demigods and want more and more and more. Sometimes they get it. If they are, if that is in their karma, they would get it or they would, you know, they please the demigod, they would get it. Some other times they may not get what they want and that would lead again to frustration. So we see how there is this repeated um, uh, word, some repeated words that are coming um. Uh, forward uh, over and over you know the first point we looked at was the futility of finding or wanting to find happiness in this material world and uh, very soon that leads to frustration the second point we uh, we discussed about was um uh, on the fact of in you know finding the happiness insubstantial wanting more and more and not getting that more and more will ultimately again lead to frustration. And the frustration can be on oneself and the frustration can also be on the demigods. And they, they, they wouldn't do any justice to themselves 
by getting angry at the demigods for not get, for not giving them what they have demanded. We see of examples where people go and they buy lots of, you know, um, food um, or, you know, uh, sweets or do big pujas uh, just to please the demigods. Uh, uh, and then, you know, you, you give me this and I will give you that as if, you know, it's a kind of bargain that they do with the, uh, with the demigods. If you give this to me, I will do a bigger puja for you. Or I will, you know, we have seen people who want to make, you know, um, jewelry for the goddesses, uh, not out of love, but only because, you know, um, um, getting into that condition with, with the demigod that if you give me this, I will give this to you. So you scratch my back, I scratch your back. Now, this is not something to be done with the demigod. That is not what the demigods are here for. Uh, but that is the understanding of such people who worship the demigods only to get something. So this is the second point that we come across. Now, then we might see people who might argue, um, as the Shastras say, uh, uh, there are people who say, um, well, I've, I've actually got happiness from what I've got. Um, I also think that whatever I have got is substantial, is enough, and I don't need more happiness. I'm fine the way it is, okay? But what they forget is the third big point that the Shastras point us to. And the third big point is the temporarity of everything, of these this kind of happiness. So we might get the happiness what we want, we might think that that happiness is enough for me in this life. But what we forget is that that happiness is not guaranteed. That happiness might go away anytime. And that happiness is temporary. So that name or fame or wealth or beauty that one has today, there is no guarantee that that name and fame and wealth and beauty will not go away tomorrow just in a wish, uh, just like that. So although we think that, you know, we take... Uh, uh, we take insurances against things, um, you know, to protect our things. Uh, we've seen of, um, we've seen players, sportsmen, uh, they even insure their um, hands and legs, uh, you know, um, just because they, they use a particular hand or they use a particular um, finger or they use their particular part of their body in, in, in performing that sports and they ensure that uh, we see of people, um, you know, insuring their animals because um, uh, they use their animals in a particular kind of um, entertainment uh, and that is their profession. So we see all these these insurances um, happening um, with, with the understanding of such people that whatever I have got is going to last forever. But that is the irony of this material life, that nothing lasts forever. So we might think that this happiness is substantial, it is enough, and I'm happy with it. But people tend to forget that there is that temporarity of things. And if one loses that happiness, which one thought was the best thing that they had, if one loses that happiness just in a jiffy, that will lead again to what we have discussed before, that will again lead to frustration. So one may go back to the demigods and ask for more and ask for more, but the demigods cannot guarantee that that is going to last forever because Kala, as Krishna says, Kala is him. The time is controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the demigods are all in the material world and they are all subjected to all the material modes of nature. And Kala is one uh, and they are also subjected to time as well. So because they, they cannot guarantee permanence, 
because they themselves are not permanent, the, the happiness that they are providing to the people who worship them is also temporary, which is unfortunately uh, lost on some of the people who uh, worship them just for material things. Now, again, we might argue or people might argue that if all those things don't happen, um, even if, you know, even if someone gets happiness, um, someone thinks that happiness is substantial and it's enough. And someone might think, oh, I've had my entire life since since childhood. I've always had it good. I've never had, uh, you know, I've never had it bad. Um, not realizing that that is the sukriti that they have accrued. Um, and because of the sukriti that they have accrued, everything happening in their life is uh, good. Uh, so they might not have, uh, you know, come across any um, major distress in life. So they might think, you know, um, uh, that happiness is continuous, it's permanent, it's going on, it's never going to end. So even if all these things, all the three things that we've talked about so far is fine for some person and they think for generations, I have seen my parents, my grandparents, and we have seen uh, for generations, they have worshipped this demigod. And this demigod has provided our family with this benediction. You know, whether it's, you know, um, good business or, you know, permanence in something, whether it's fame or any kind of thing, you know, in any kind of, you know, um, having, um, uh, having uh, you know, good relatives or it could be any kind of material um, uh, uh, material gain. It could just be good health. Everyone, you know, we see some families where um, people in the family, they all live um, uh, um, up to their, say, 90s, mid 90s, even reach 100. So it is all in their ge genetics. So we see certain families have, you know, long standing member of families that they live for a long time. So uh, good health and they, they might be worshipping a demigod. So they might think all of this is fine for me. So there is absolutely nothing wrong in me worshipping this demigod. But again, what the Shastras tell us is that what people will forget this, uh, uh, forget is that despite having all of this, they forget the final nail in the coffin is forgetting the fact that there is duality in life. So if there is happiness, again, we go back to the first point, if there is happiness, happiness cannot exist in the material world without distress. If there is hot in this material world, there is cold. If there is a uh, tall, there is a short. If there is black, there is a, um, a white. So if there is happiness, there is automatically going to be distress. So this duality in life, it cannot be um, overcome in this material world. And that tells us why we really, really should seek the spiritual world, because in the spiritual world, everything is absolute. There is that absence of duality. It's just like, you know, people say, oh, I just want happiness. And if you if you remember those, um, um, the CDs we used to buy before, nowadays there aren't, you know, CDs aren't very popular nowadays. But if we, in, uh, you know, the CDs which we had, they had songs in them. Some of the songs were our favorites. Some were not particularly favorites. So we, we kind of say, I only want to, I only want a CD with only my favorite songs, but I wouldn't really get that. I would have to buy the CD, which has my favorite songs, but also has some other songs, which are not my favorite, which I could do without. Similarly, when we seek for happiness, we only want the happiness, but we do not really want the distress, but we cannot avoid having that distress because with happiness automatically comes the distress with anything and everything in life we cannot ignore 
the, the duality of this material world. So anything we worship the demigods for, anything we ask for, we have to remember these four things that, you know, they are not permanent. They might not be sufficient for us. There is that duality which automatically will lead to certain things which I did not really want, the unwanted things as well. And of course, the major thing is that, you know, the happiness, which I really think I will get from the demigod, that really is not the true happiness. That's just the absence of distress. So that is the reason Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita 5.22, Yehi Samparsha Jabhoga Dukha Yonahaya Evate Adi Antavantaha Konteya Nate Shuramate Budaha or an intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery, which are due to contact with the material senses. O son of Kunti, such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and so the wise man does not delight in them. So this is exactly what Prabhupada also mentions in the purpose, purport. the wise men, the intelligent men, they do not dwell on such miseries, such uh, pleasures which have a beginning and an end. So with every type of sukha, there is a dukkha and we have to remember that. Now, um, we we also have to remember that we are not meant to be over here. Uh, this is not our original home. And therefore, why would one want this home? Why would one want to uh, have something only for this material life when we must ideally look for going beyond this uh, home, going back to our original home? Now, um, one of the reasons is that um, people do not know the truth. Uh, people um, have, um, you know, they, they have either not had the opportunity of coming across the truth or they do not uh, want to know the truth. Or thirdly, they do not understand the truth if even if they are told the truth. Um, so that is the reason um, our Shastras, they understand this, they understand that it's not easy for everybody, especially, you know, as the yugas um, advance and we, come, we are in the Kali Yuga now where, you know, we hardly have any devotees. Um, so the, the Shastras understand this and that is the reason they have um, they have uh, given us a way to fulfill our material desire, but in a way that will gradually, gradually purify our consciousness so that we go beyond just wanting the material things and we go beyond that and we want to go, want to go and reach the spiritual. So most people work hard to say, for example, get money. Uh, and the scriptures say that, okay, fine, if you want money, worship this God and you will get money. For If you want a good relationship, you worship this God, you go to this God. If you want position, you go to this God. If you want all of these material things, at least do it worship this god but by worshiping this god we are doing it with the with, try to do it in the righteous way and not in a nefarious manner and that is what the shastras are telling us that yes if you want to if you want to worship a demigod worship that demigod but do it in a righteous way do it in the right way for the right reason not in a nefarious manner because we have also seen unfortunately people worshiping demigods um, wanting to harm others um, just for personal gain so if one gets if one loses the track of dharma one can actually go to the demigods just please the demigods and um, you know, uh, want harm on others uh, for own selfish gain. But the Shastras are selling, telling us don't do that. Now, um, and Prabhupada also gives us the example of Ravana in the purport. 
and how great a devotee he was. He was a great devotee of Lord Shiva. And because he was a Brahmana, and I think I've mentioned this before, uh, because he was a Brahmana, uh, Lord Shiva was so pleased with him, he even invited him during the Vya Pravesh of his, um, of his palace that he built for Mother Parvati in, in uh, Mount Kailash. Um, and Lord Shiva uh, actually went there as the Brahmana to do that, to perform the, um, the, the puja. Uh, and then after that, because, uh, um, you know, after the puja, you you pay something, you give dakshina or you give something to uh, the brahmana. When Lord Shiva asked uh, Ravana what he wants, um, and that is Ravana, you know, uh, that tells exactly what kind of person he was, or, or rather what kind of demon he was. Um, and he said um, he wanted Mother Parvati. Uh, so there's the whole pastime about, you know, how um, Lord Vishnu actually saves Mother Parvati from uh, Ravana, but that's a different pastime altogether. But we see how <laughs> slowly and steadily, despite the fact that he was a great, great devotee of Lord Shiva, uh, Ravana lost his, uh, <laughs> lost uh, uh, the favourite, uh, lo, uh, uh, or rather lost being the favorite of Lord Shiva because continuously and continually he um um he he followed the path of Atharma rather than Tama and he fell from grace. So <coughs> ultimately we see um Ravana not being supported by Lord Shiva even during the crucial time and in fact he he was actually killed the main reason as to how uh, his downfall started was through Hanumanji uh, who is nobody but a partial incarnation of the Rudra form of uh, Rudra form of Lord Shiva so we see even if he worship the demigods if we actually worship the demigods for the wrong reasons um to harm people that does not lead us anywhere uh and that is something that have been warned uh even Prabhupada is warning us against in the purport um the other point to keep in mind is um that um you know in our in our our concept of god um, so in, in the Judeo-Christian uh, concept of God, um, God is, uh, we see sometimes that God is the jealous God and God says that you either worship me and it is only me or there is nobody else. But in the Vedic culture, we do not, we do not have a jealous God. We have a zealous God, as Keshav Swami was saying. We have a zealous God, and zealous meaning enthusiastic, very eager, and very interested in something. So our zealous God, Lord Krishna, tells us that, yes, we, I am everything. I am the God, and it is only me who is God. But if you do not want pure devotional service, if you are unable to perform pure devotion, then you can worship the demigods and you can get the material things that you desire. So in the Vedic conception, God allows the demigods to be worshipped. That does not mean that there are many gods. So there is a difference between uh, being, uh, uh, there is a difference between polytheism and polyculturism. So polytheism is having many gods and we strictly maintain that we are not a polytheistic um, uh, culture or tradition or, you know, or Sanatana Dharma. We are not so. We believe that there is only one God. But what we do say is that the Vedic path is polyculturistic. And what do we mean by that? By polyculturistic, we mean that it allows, um, our culture allows an entry point of devotion or an entry point to devotion. <laughs> mm. 
we say that the Vedic part allows an entry point to devotion according to the level of spiritual evolution someone has. <coughs> so if someone is very highly spiritual, they have a particular entry point to devotion. If someone is not that devoted, devoted or has minimal understanding of devotion, they can get an entry point to devotion through the demigods. It is just a ladder of spiritual advancement. And that is what the Vedic culture allows. So in this way, demigod worship can be described uh, and or has been described in Bhagavad <laughs> So we say that, you know, in one way, um, we can worship demigods as, as long as it is done in the right way. But people might also argue that, you know, you say that um, there is only one God, but uh, you also worship different gods. Uh, now, what do they mean by that? Um, what they do mean is that some people worship Krishna, some people worship Vishnu, some people may worship Lord Ram, the others might worship Lord Narasimhadev. <laughs> so we are saying that, you know, so they might argue, how can you say that you are saying it's just one God? But what we say is that, you know, although um, we are worshipping various gods, they are all the same. We are, they are just the expansion of the same God. So we are not saying that <clears throat> Lord Han uh, Lord Narsimhadev is different to Lord Krishna, is different to Lord Vishnu, is different to Lord Narayana. What we have to understand is that they are all expansions of the same God, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, as as um, uh, we hear in the in Pag in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, in the first canto, um, chapter 3, verse 28, Ete Chamsa Kalaha Pumsa Krishna Sti Bhagavan Swayam. Or, all of the incarnations are either plenary portions or portions of the plenary portions of the Lord. But, Lord Sri Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. So, this is something we really, really need to understand. Um, and furthermore, we also see that we never, ever worship Krishna just by himself. So in all the temples we go to, we see that there is Radharani with Krishna. There is Mother Sita with Lord Ram. There is uh, uh, Mother Lakshmi with Lord Na with uh, Narayana. So we always see the feminine divinity of the God. So our God is not just the male form. And as we know, that's one of my favorite quotes. And as Chaitanya Charitamrita says, that Radha Krishna ek atma dui dehotori. Anonno Vilashya Rasha Ashwadan Kari or Radha and Krishna are one and same, but they have assumed two bodies. Thus, they enjoy each other, tasting the mellows of love. <clears throat> and that's from Chaitanya Charitamrita 4.56. So we understand that the divinity that we have cannot exist just by himself. Although Krishna is the origin of all, but he always is present with his feminine form as well. So one might argue one who worships the demigods and do not want to and, and think that ours is a culture of, you know, lots of gods. They might argue that <clears throat> you have so many lords you have so many gods and you also are saying that you have a feminine form and that is the thing that we have to understand and again we are pointed to the less intelligent and the more intelligent the more intelligent who are on the higher spiritual ladder will understand that krishna is the original personality of Godhead and he has many expansions and Krishna is also always present with his feminine form 
and they're all the same. So we might worship them in many ways. So there is, there is, um, you know, there is, there is the a multiple uh, nature to his uh, expansions, but at the same time, it is all the same. He's only one God. Um, similarly, one may say, okay, if if the Shastras are also saying it is not completely wrong uh, <clears throat> to uh, worship the demigods, uh, but at the same time, you're also advising us not to worship the demigod. You're asking us to directly worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that is again where Prabhupada uh, and the Shastras tell us that yes, please do, um, get, uh, you know, you can definitely worship the demigods, mm -hmm. but you have to remember that there are three reasons, three primary reasons, um, as Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita chapter seven, three primary reasons with the, which the less intelligent people must remember when worshipping the demigods. And the first is that the fruits that are provided by the demigods are only temporary. Secondly, that these then the, that the demigods are they do not uh uh or the less intelligent people they do not realize that the demigods are not the source of the power they might think that what they are getting is completely from the demigods but they don't realize that the actual source of all that power that comes to the demigods is nobody but krishna it's like when you have the prime minister and have lots of ministers under the prime minister each minister is independent and has his or her own power but that power is limited to a certain after a certain point because the ultimate power lies with the prime minister and there are certain things where these ministers have to get sanction from the prime minister to be able to perform their own duty. Similarly, the demigods are not the original source of whatever is being given to uh, as, as benedictions or boons to the people who worship them. These inter less intelligent people must understand that the actual source is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that's the second point one needs to understand. And the third point is that they need to remember that the demigods are also, uh, they can also come under the influence of calm or lust. We see so many demigods, they perform, you know, we see, we've seen Indra, how he was, you know, he was overcome by lust and he um, seduced Ahalya. We see Indra again, you know, overcome by pride. We see Lord Brahma overcome by ignorance and a bit of ego as well. when he didn't want to believe that a small child like Krishna in Vrindavan um, was more powerful than him. So we see demigods are... Um, they have the propensity to fall down because they are also covered by Maya to a large extent because they are in the material world. So theirs is also an impermanent state. So this is something we really need to remember when worshipping the demigod. I've got one more minute. So I'll just finish quickly. So then how... Should we, so the the uh, Parvatam has given us that, yes, you can, you know, if you want this, you can worship so, so and so demigods. So what is the right way to worship the demigods? So as, as I said right at the beginning, as Vaishnavas, we do not follow either extreme. We do not um, completely, you know, blindly follow the demigods. Neither do we ignore them or disrespect them. What we need to understand is that the demigods should be worshipped as a, as a ladder towards going or getting pure devotion. We have to remember that it is better to worship them if we do not follow, if we don't have devotion, it's better to uh, uh, worship the demigods because they are devotees as well. 
And if we worship them without, with the right intentions, in the righteous way, the demigods will ultimately lead us towards pure bhakti, slowly and steadily. We have to remember that, you know, uh, <clears throat> it, is the, it is our first step towards uh, devotion. And so, if we are to worship the demigods, if we, you know, for, for whatever reason, we um, shouldn't be completely uh, and totally go to them with a shopping list, wanting this and that, but we need to uh, remember that, um, you know, we need to worship them as a stepping ladder towards achieving devotion. Uh, we see uh, the gopis uh, worshipping Mother Katyani only because they wanted Krishna as their husband. Um, we see uh, you know, Lord Chaitanya going to the South, uh, going to South India, worshipping Lord Shiva and going to the Shiva temples. So we see the Lord himself and the, devote, the greatest devotees of Lord, they have worshipped the demigods. We see Lord Rama worshipping uh, um, uh, Lord Shiva as well in the Ramayana. But we see the Lord himself and the greatest devotees of the Lord, the gopis, giving us examples that yes, the demigods can indeed be worshipped, but they, they, but they should be worshipped with the right purpose in mind, with the want of achieving the ultimate, and the ultimate is pure bhakti for Lord Krishna. So that is uh, that is how we should worship the demigods. So with that, we um, we finish our discussion for today. Please do forgive me if I have made any mistakes or if there are any any uh, corrections, please do correct me. Hare Krishna Mataji, Dandad uh, Pranam. Yeah, very nicely explained uh, different points. Why should we shouldn't approach demigods and for uh, for temporary benefits and for uh, uh, insubstantiality and then so futile uh, nature of the the, the results. So uh, nicely explained and then you know I know uh, all all things are temporary, including the results are very temporary. And uh, when we when we have this when we have the 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 whole river why should we why should we uh, drink water from the well <laughs> so thank you so much mataji um, any questions or comments hare krishna hare krishna krishna mataji very nice class thank you 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 explain nicely why one should not uh, worship the demigods which is great uh, one little thing that i would like to point out here is that um when the Lord come as a devotee, or like Chidyama Prabhu, he came as a devotee of the Lord, so he had to give examples. That's why uh, he would pray to Lord Shiva. But Lord Ram, he did not pray to Lord Shiva. He In Rameshwaram, he yes. built, uh, he made the um, kind of the deity, the stand of Lord Shiva, just to let Lord Shiva know that he, Lord Ram was going to kill his favorite uh, devotee, his favorite disciple, like uh, Ravana. He did not pray. Many people get this um, misconception that Lord Ram prayed to Lord Shiva. He never prayed to Lord Shiva. Thanks. Some people say, he, mm. sorry, Mataji, you know there is a confusion between the Ramacharit Manasa, Tulsidas Ramayan, and the Valmiki Ramayan. But yes. the authentic one is Valmiki Ramayan. There is yeah. nowhere written that Lord uh, Ram was praying to Lord Shiva. Yeah. So, yes, and uh, Lord Shiva, or Lord Shiva came, he gave the arrow to Lord Ram. But when Lord Ram said, is this is what I'm going to do, then Lord Shiva came, he, he gave the arrow. And then Bibi-san told Lord Ram, you keep uh, shooting. Uh, Lord Ram didn't want to shoot in the heart because his mother Sita is in is his heart because he had mother Sita in his heart. So, then Bibi San said, shoot in the navel, there is a nectar. Once the nectar comes out, that one will drop. So this is very nice, very nice, Mataji, very uh, uh, deep research you have done. Even listening to Maharaj and then narrating is not easy. 
So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike, for pointing that out. And um, you're absolutely right. Um, it is um, uh, mentioned only in Ram Charit Manas about uh, Lord Rama worshipping Lord Shiva. It isn't mentioned, yeah. Uh, but thank you so much, yeah, for uh, for pointing that and correcting me. Thank you. Yes, Mataji, as as uh, as bhaktas, uh, as we are followers of Lord Krishna, uh, we should read only Palmiki Ramayan. Because uh, Valmiki, uh, Tulsidas is, is Valmiki himself. Tulsidas was cursed to come in the Kali Yuga to write the, 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 uh, Valmiki, the uh, uh, Tulsidas uh, Ramayan. He was cursed. See, it, it's Valmiki himself. But the thing is, because in Kali Yuga, everything is polluted. So mm -hmm. even the, the um, scriptures also changes, changes a lot. Right. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mataji. Thank and uh, now we do. We should respect the, the demigods, but we should not ask anything. Like we pray to ask the, them to guide us towards the Lord. Like uh, Mother Sita prayed, prayed uh, to get Lord Ram, and uh, the gopis prayed to get uh, Lord Krishna. So they are getting the Lord. They're not getting anything material, which is which is uh, the right way of praying to the demigods. Yes. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna, Thank you so much. Thank you, Mataji. Thank you. Thank you, Mataji, uh, for this questions and answers. Uh, Hare Krishna. Um, I'd like to request Indulekha Mataji to close the session. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone. So, um, again, we should, we should thank Mataji so much. Now we got a clear idea. Uh, if we pray a demigod, what we should ask, not material benefit, just ask for the Lord, and then uh, our path will be clearer. Uh, you know, some people, what happens is they are used to praying the demigod because their 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 parents or their grandparents have been praying to Lord, Lord Shiva, or Lord Ganesha, or Lord Hanumanji. So we are not telling them to just overnight throw the deity away. Keep the deity. But add Lord Krishna on top and put Lord Krishna on a higher level. If you have your altar at home, put the demigods at the lower level and then Krishna and Radha and Krishna on the higher level. Add, never, never tell them to minus because when we tell them to stop or take the deity of the altar, they get like frustrated. Why are you going to, why are you telling me this? I have been praying since, since, I, since I know if my parents have been praying. So we don't tell that. We say add. Add Lord Krishna and, and Lord Rama to to the uh, on the altar and put on a higher uh, on a higher shelf. Yes. So yes. thank you very much, Mataji. So and much. I will request everyone to unmute and let's say Hare Krishna Mahamantra uh, to glorify um, Panchali Mataji for this very nice class today. <laughs> and you. Krishna, Krishna, Jai. And the fourth verse of Indi Jai, Shila Prabhupada Jai. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Prabhupada Jai, for hosting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.